This video is going to be on secondary hemostasis. Just to recap, primary hemostasis is when you have a bleeding blood vessel and your platelets come in and form the fibrinogen drape. That's primary hemostasis. Secondary hemostasis is turning that fibrinogen drape into a sturdier fibrin. So fibrinogen to fibrin. Now fibrin is sturdier because fibrin stacks easier. Fibrinogen has um, something on the structure that doesn't make it stack as well. So it's just harder for it to stack. And by turning it into fibrin, we can stack it easier and it makes that sturdier. So this is the quintessential part of our secondary hemostasis. So we turn fibrinogen into fibrin with uh, some helpers, about a dozen of them. We call those coagulation factors. Some of them can auto-activate whenever they see a bleed. So we call that intrinsic coagulation factors or just the intrinsic pathway. Some of them, however, need um, an extra push, some sort of external stimuli, an external push to make it work. And those factors we call the extrinsic factors or the extrinsic pathway. But either way you cut it, both of these have a common goal to make fibrinogen into fibrin. And so they'll converge for this common goal. And when they converge, it forms a common pathway. That's what makes fibrinogen into fibrin. Now it's not as easy as just fibrinogen into fibrin. There are a couple extra steps. For example, you get the coagulation factor 10 and that activates and become activated factor 10. So just 10 A, the A just means activated. And with the help of factor five as a cofactor, it will turn prothrombin AKA factor two into thrombin to two A. And then finally thrombin, it is thrombin that will eventually turn fibrinogen into fibrin. Because this is our, this is our quintessential part of hemo, secondary hemostasis, fibrinogen is the actual first coagulation factor. So coagulation factor one and one A. That is a common pathway, so just, just a few extra steps uh, just to be aware of. Let's talk about the extrinsic pathway first. The extrinsic pathway, like I said, needs a little push. It needs some, uh, some sort of external stimuli. And the external stimuli comes when your, your blood vessels break. We say when your blood vessels break, it releases some factors to tell it, hey, tell your body, hey, you know, I need some help here. And so one of those things is tissue factor. Tissue factor will float around and a coagulation factor, namely coagulation factor seven, will see that tissue factor, bind to that tissue factor and activate. So it becomes activated seven. And that activated seven will jump into a common pathway. Easy, that's, <laughs> that's your extrinsic pathway, all done. Not too bad. Your intrinsic pathway um, has a few more steps. Your intrinsic path pathway, like I said, can auto-activate when it sees damage. Um, it's kind of like our first step in, in primary hemostasis. Remember what our first step in primary hemostasis was? It was vasoconstriction, right? When you cut the blood vessel, it'll automatically vasoconstrict. Um, the nerves and the muscle will intrinsically do that. It doesn't hurt, however, to release some substances to kind of facilitate it. We talked about endothelin. In the same vein, in the intrinsic pathway will auto-activate, but it doesn't hurt for some substances to be released and kind of facilitate it, kind of help it accelerate it along, okay? So intrinsic pathway starts with factor 12. That becomes activated, factor 12. And the thing that helps it along is gonna be the kinin system. The kinin system works when there's um, vessel damage and also inflammation. The kinin system has something called high molecular weight kininogen and high molecular weight kininogen will kind of help it along yeah just to give it a little push doesn't need it that's why it's intrinsic but it just helps it along and like dominoes 12 will work on 11 and 11 will work on not 10 because 10 is part of our common pathway we'll work on 9 etc etc so like dominoes 12 will work on 11 or 11 
We'll work on 10 because 10 is part of our common pathway. Work on, instead, work on nine. That becomes activated nine. And then a cofactor to activated nine is gonna be eight. And eventually eight will jump in our common pathway. Not too bad, hopefully. Um, just a side note, high molecular, just a side note, high molecular weight kind of engine, because we're talking about the kinin system. I just want to tie and see some other blocks we talked about. We'll turn into Brady kinin via calocrine. Um, Brady kinin, if you remember, is seen in inflammation. So I'm not really talking about blood vessels here, but seen inflammation causes uh, permeability, causes pain. So if the word kinin seems kind of familiar to you, it's because probably you're thinking of Brady kinin. So those are our intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. They finally form and turn our fibrinogen into fibrin. And you have your nice, lovely clot. And the bleeding will stop and the uh, tissue will eventually heal. Now here's the thing. Um, we don't want that clot to be permanent. Yeah, we want to eventually get rid of the clot. How do we get rid of the clot? That is a system called the fibrinolytic system. The fibrinolytic. Fibrinolytic. What's in the name? Lytic means to break apart. Break apart fibrin, yeah? That's the name of the game, the break apart fibrin. And it does this with a protein called plasminogen. Now plasminogen by itself is inactive, so it can't break apart fibrin, but it loves to attach to fibrin. So if you have your clot with all those fibrin fibers, a nice sturdy clot, then plasminogen will go ahead and attach to it. And as your wound starts to heal, it'll start to release things like urokinase, things like streptokinase, but more important, importantly, things like tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. And that will turn plasminogen into plasmin. So plasminogen becomes activated, and since it's already on fibrin, it can just chomp, 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 break apart fibrin, and you break apart your clot. As it does this, it produces some, um, some, I guess, remains of fibrin, and that's D-dimer. Important clinical thing to know. And that is how you break your clot, and that is your fibrinolytic system. Now, that's not the only thing that regulates clots. We have a few other things. We have things like protein C. We have things like protein S. We have things like anti thrombin what a name anti-thrombin anti basically the thing that turns fibrinogen into fibrin we'll start with protein c protein c is made in your liver and protein c has an affinity for the coagulation factors that act as cofactors so we talked about eight we talked about five so i'll block five and eight and by doing that it kind of regulates clots what is protein s protein s is just is friend so protein c is friend it helps direct and facilitate C. So it's kind of, um, it indirectly helps clots. It helps protein C, you know, regulate clots. So protein S is his friend. What's antithrombin? Antithrombin is a seri, serine protease inhibitor. What the heck is a serine protease? That's just a, a enzyme that broke, breaks down serine proteins, and there are a ton of them. Um, but you should know that a lot of coagulation factors are serine proteins, so this inhibits a lot of the coagulation factors. In, in fact, it inhibits probably half of them. However, the most important one you should know is gonna be two and 10. Two is our thrombin. That should be reason enough. That's the thing that turns fibrinogen into fibrin. 10 is the thing that everything feeds into are, are basically our, our common denominator. That's our common pathway that everything feeds into. So by blocking those is a really strong anticoagulant. Yeah, it helps regulate coag factors and coagulation. That's your secondary hemostasis. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.